This is an extreme future we're heading towards. And it's an extreme future that's attempting to understand a real-time consumer. A consumer whose expectations about the immediacy of satisfaction, an immediacy of entitlement, an immediacy of data, information, services, and convenience is just beginning. And the consumers today, I call them the real-time consumers, they're the ones that really don't care whether you get it or not. They don't really care if your IT budget is going to support wireless platforms integrated with banking platforms, integrated with telecom platforms. They don't really know or care or make the difference between HTTP and POP. And they don't care. What do they care about? They care about being enabled and empowered. And they view technology in this extreme future as enabling and empowering them. That's all they really care about. And the question is, are you ready to help them navigate through this extreme future? Do you have the kind of cultural mindset, which I call real-time agility, to be able to change fast enough? Over the next five to 10 years, the acceleration vector will be a 1,000 times more. So now, all of a sudden, product cycles, instead of going ahead and we're going to work on a product now and bring it out over the next two years, we're going to work on it and bring it out over the next six months. The question is, will we have the skilled workers necessary to be able to meet these challenges, to manage this complexity, this explosion of global GDP? My point of saying that is because of low fertility in the United States and in uh, certainly Europe uh, and Japan, you have the opposite phenomenon than what's happening in the rest of the world. So you've got, and I'll go into this, you've got a youth bulge in uh, the developing countries, certainly the Middle East, Africa, and, and, and Asia, particularly uh, India and China. And you've got an aging society with low fertility in the West. Now, you could look at this and say from a workforce uh, planning point of view, this is a perfect storm. But about 50 other industries in the United States and Europe are going to be dealing with the same challenge. So all of a sudden what this means is a huge competition for talent. You're going to be competing with other industries that have the same demographic problem in terms of the future of the workforce. So if you're concerned about the viability of, for instance, even your retirement or the viability of your field as such in an expanding global marketplace with less and less you know, uh, and new entrants from your domestic area, less bodies, if you will, and then you combine that with the challenges of new innovations which require the learning curve of skills for a diminishing workforce, all of a sudden, you're, it's a very different kind of marketplace than it's been the past 20 years. By 2025, my, our forecast at the Institute for Global Futures is, regardless of, of how much oil is found, what alternative energy can produce, certainly not more than 10 to 15%, uh, worldwide under certainly 20 percent. We will not be producing enough energy worldwide with, by 2025, certainly almost by 2020, to be able to keep pace with GDP. That's forecast number one, which means it'll be a drag on GDP and corporate profits. Two, population is expanding in this two worlds challenge we need to be able to step up and meet. My forecast is at least a third of the organizations will not, wherever you are in the world, will not adapt fast enough and will merge, collaborate, go disappear. Well, I'm here to kind of give you an overview of what the next top technologies are, but also to put in perspective some of the key market drivers that may give you a perspective of your business, but also maybe give you a perspective about the business yet to come. You know, the customers that you don't have yet that you might want to have, or the, the market that you're not in yet, or multiple markets that you're not in yet that you might want to be because of some of the drivers I'll talk about. Um, I will also talk about some technologies that may seem strange to you. Uh, some of these technologies may be around nanotechnology, which you may not be in today. But as a fundamental transformation in material science, I can tell you when it comes to retail, packaging, and logistics, it's going to be very critical new technology, and it'll hit there first. I'll also talk a little bit about chips, what's coming next for chips. Certainly, the most exciting new uh, transformation in the chip space is what's happening with GPS. You're talking about a marketplace in China 
uh, the better part of 1.3 billion people, uh, half of them, 700 plus uh, million under the age of 25. This is a market in terms of, of retail, in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of warehousing that hasn't happened yet alone. We're sitting at probably the most exciting time in the history of technology and business because it hasn't happened yet. This is very, very early in the game. And I'll give you a sense of why we're early in the game and what are some of the key drivers, not just population, but also convergent technologies that will accelerate demand for things that you're doing today and a lot more. Perhaps the most important part of what's going to happen to healthcare is it's increasingly going to become more predictive and you're going to have better diagnostic tools to make it more personalized. So let's break it down and see what it looks like. Uh, this is based on a study that I was a, a co-author of for the National Science Foundation. We looked at over the horizon of what's coming next in terms of uh, healthcare and human performance, and we broke down four key technology buckets that I think will shape the future of healthcare, and I'll share with you what they are. And the services on the internet increasingly are going to be geared towards being able to provide consumer health information and even facilitating certain kinds of healthcare services. You'll see a lot more about that. So the next generation of information and networks. And also what's on your, what's on your desktop today, you'll wear it tomorrow in terms of computing technology which could be, again, when you combine this with a, the demographic of people wanting to live longer and live healthier, and the opportunities for wireless healthcare, which is just beginning to start today, wireless diagnostics, wireless distributed platform healthcare, you're gonna see a lot more opportunities, many more innovations. What's next for biotech is all about this, this fusion of biotechnology and healthcare will create much faster discovery of new drugs, particularly in areas, as I said earlier, cancer. I'm looking for major innovations in the area of cancer. Imagine a world where it's based on predictive diagnostic technology, the ability to be able to have early detection baked in, the ability to be able to look at a genomic profile and understand that there are these five different key per precursors to organ dysfunction, system problems, or potential precursors for diabetes alone, just diabetes alone. You're talking about, again, in a $2.2 trillion you know, healthcare spend, might we with predictive prevention therapies be able to save the better part of a half a trillion dollars? I'm forecasting yes we can, because the model today, of course, is, as most of us know, is not sustainable. We can't continue to go through Medicare cuts, we can't continue to to decrease uh, the, the amount of dollars that is made and reimbursed and continue to provide the same kind of care. So something's got to change in the fundamental part of how we think about healthcare. And this new health paradigm's got to be based on, if you will, rethinking this next generation of medicine that's emerging. So if it's based on prevention, you know, what would a practice that's based on prevention, health promotion, disease management, what would that look like as opposed to just healthcare? So the path to personalized medicine is emerging today. The key theme certainly is that there are radical innovations that are emerging, and these radical innovations, much faster than ever before, are gonna create opportunity for you. So the good news is there's a lot more technology coming sooner, much faster. Um, I'm going to talk about four key power tools that will transform healthcare in the 21st century. They are nano, bio, IT, and neuroscience, or cognitive science. We'll talk a little bit about the convergence of these four power tools, and I'll lay down kind of a logic path about uh, how they will enhance us. In fact, health enhancement will be the largest marketplace, the largest industry in the 21st century. You better get ready for new technologies. You better get ready for where we're going in this era because the convergence of nanobio, IT, and neuroscience is going to create a variety of new tools with greater visibility, greater opportunities to enhance performance, care, quality, and a good ROI. And we're just at the edge of this when I say this is the emerging post-industrial transformation because we don't have the tools yet. Your hospitals are actually competing with other nations today for a variety of treatments. And when you look at the constant, the key demographic that is driving the future of healthcare in terms of uh, technology deployment, in terms of care utilization, 
its aging baby boomer wealth. The largest concentration of wealth in the history of the world is sitting with baby boomers, $14 trillion. And what do baby boomers want? They want to live forever with the vitality of a 25-year-old. For an insightful, dynamic, and provocative presentation that your audience will remember, consider the leading global futurist, Dr. James Canton.